is good. The Lord is good. Okay. How many of you have your Bibles? Amen. All right. Have you got your Bibles? All right. Tonight we will uh, quickly head back to 2 Timothy um, and, and then we'll go to another portion of Scripture. But uh, we are beginning to deal with um, a question that we're asking ourselves. It's a new series. And the, the question is, do we really believe what we say we believe? Do we really believe what we say we believe? And the emphasis is on really. Um, and uh, we're going to deal with that question by looking at um, some fundamentals of the faith. We use the word doctrine, which is teaching. We're going to look at some of the fundamental teachings of the faith and hopefully be able to ask ourselves, okay, do we really believe this? And, and it's not, it can't be just that we say it and that we believe in our mind, it's got to be, is it being lived out in our lives? Because when you really believe something, action comes from that belief. When, when we say we believe something, but action and lifestyle doesn't change at all, um, that's just, you know, fake news. <laughs> I, I, I mean, that's nothing. That's just a, well, yeah, I, I'm making a statement uh, maybe to be a part of a group or to make myself feel better. But if, if, if there's not action to back it up, then there's something wrong. And we see this in the Word of God. We see something very important in 2 Timothy chapter 3 in the last two verses of that chapter. And this is kind of our theme for the, the entirety of the study. So all Scripture is inspired by God and it's profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. And when we look at that um, 16th verse specifically, uh, we, we see four things there. We see that the word of God is profitable for teaching. And we've said this is the standard. God's word sets a standard of what is right or wrong, of, of what we should, um, you know, hopefully orient our lives to. And we all look for standards and we all need standards. For most people, the standard is what everyone else is doing. So if everyone else likes this or everyone else dresses this way or thinks this way or whatever, most folk, the standard is whatever, whatever, whatever everybody else is doing, that's my standard. But actually the standard is the word of God. And then the scriptures are also profitable for reproof, which is basically showing us where the standard is. And then like a mirror, maybe showing us where we're not measuring up to the standard. Are we lacking in some place where here's the standard, but we're here? That's reproof to remind us and to show us, to show us these things. Then we also said, and this was uh, last week, that the word is profitable for correction. So that closes the gap. Okay, I not only want to know if I'm not meeting the standard, but it's not good enough to just know, okay, I'm not meeting the standard. That, that's, that's somebody that you don't want to live with or be around that all they can do is say you're not measuring up. But they don't, they don't tell you how to measure up or they don't encourage you to. It's just, yeah, you're not measuring up. So, so if we stopped at reproof but we didn't go any further, then it would kind of be discouraging. But correction in the Word of God shows us how can we make up the gap. How can I go from here's the standard and here I am, but how can I start moving up toward the standard? And then, of course, the last point is for training in righteousness. And this actually helps us to put these corrective measures into daily practice where it's not just once in a while, but we actually are moving in a direction and we're staying in that same direction. We don't want to, to be corrected and, and make two steps over here and then a week or a month or a year later, we're back over here again. And then a long period of time goes by and, oh, yeah, boy, I need to move over here. And then now I'm back over here. We want to be trained in righteousness so that we're continually progressing and moving forward. Amen. So are you with me on that? So we're asking ourselves the question, do we really believe what we say we believe? And I would take you to two scriptures. Let's go first of all. And these will be back to back books. Let's go to Romans. Let's go to the book of Romans, chapter one. So we'll go to Romans chapter 1, and then from there we'll go to the next book, which is 1 Corinthians. So Romans chapter 1. And we're told something about humanity's condition 
in Romans chapter 1. And we're just going to read verses 18 through 20. Verses 18 through 20 of Romans chapter 1. And this is applicable to every person, no matter where they're born, no matter what nationality, no matter what ethnicity, nothing matters. This is every person that is unsaved, that is born into this world, that is, is, does not know Jesus Christ. This is, this is describing them. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness because that which is known about God is evident within them for God made it evident to them. So the first thing is, is that the Lord says, okay, everyone has something within themselves that points to the fact that there is a creator God and that we should at least be seeking him. And we call that our what? Our conscience. Every person has a conscience. Little children have a conscience. If they steal from the cookie jar when mommy told them not to, and then mommy catches them, they get a, a look on their face. or they, you know, they, It's not just a, a straight-up, bold-faced lie the very first time. Now, that may happen over the course of some time, but initially there's a conscience that says, oh, yeah, I shouldn't have done that. We see this all the time. We, every once in a while we're watching these America's Funniest Videos thing. And, these ki- and, they, and the parents will set up a camera out of the kid's range and they'll tell these kids, okay, now I'm, I'm putting some cookies out in front of you. You can't have them yet, though. You've got to wait. Don't, don't touch them until I come back. And, of course, the whole point is, is we're going to watch and see how the kids struggle to want the, the candy, and, and yet they're going to hold off. And, you know, that's kind of the point is there is a struggle there, generally. That's our conscience speaking to us. So the, so the scriptures tell us that all of us have a conscience. But what we do is we suppress the truth. After a while, we don't, get, we don't like our conscience telling us this is right or wrong. We want to do what we want to do. And so we suppress the truth, as verse 18 tells us. But God has made it evident to us. And then he gives us the second thing in verse 20. There's two things that, that give us evidence of God. First one is conscience. The second one is creation. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible attributes, his eternal power, his divine nature have been clearly seen being understood through what has been made so that they, all believers, are without excuse. So we have our conscience that tells us there is a right and a wrong and that there is there's someone that has created us and that's when we have these feelings of right and wrong. And then we also have creation. All of the stars in the sky, all of the beauty on this earth, everyone, everything around us screams that there is a creator and we should seek him out. So these are two things that every single person on the face of the earth, they have these things, their, their, their conscience and God's creation, and they display God's goodness. They display God's wisdom. They display God's power. And so all of us are without excuse. Every, this is why no one will ever be able to stand before God and just say, I didn't know I was supposed to seek you. And I don't care where they're at. I don't care if they're on a little island of just a little tribe of people in the middle of nowhere. They have their conscience and they have creation that tells them they need to seek after God. All right. And, and so, so no one is going to be able to stand before God and offer a valid excuse as to why they did not give thought to God and to his will. All right. Having said that, conscience and creation alone is not enough to lead us to salvation. They are a starting block for us, but we need to know about a certain individual, don't we? We need to know about Jesus. So anywhere and everywhere, here's the deal, where people will seek out and genuinely seek and cry out to God, I I see in the scriptures that God will give them what they need to begin to move on that journey towards him. And whether that is sending a missionary there, whether that's a a track, whether that's through radio, or some means that if they want to seek God, God will reveal more of himself to them and show them Jesus Christ. So so God in all of his wisdom and all of his grace at various times and various ways has revealed himself. And that's the point here. God has declared his will. It's not like God has been sitting up in heaven and playing hide and seek. Oh, I just, I want to sit back here and I want to watch all these human beings mess up. 
And I'm just so ready. I want to send them all to hell. I'm just so ready. So I'm going to hide myself. The opposite. God has done everything that he can do without violating our free will. That's the one thing he will not do. And he shouldn't do. Amen. Are you with me on that? Free will is, is the gift that God has given every human being. He's not going to violate that. Apart from violating our free will, God has done everything to reveal his will and his desire to us. And the primary way that he's done it is he has given us the scriptures. He has given us his word. And so we, we have his word preserved for us, proclaimed to us, his truth protected for us. Down through the centuries, the church has stood as a, um, a, a, a place where God's truth can prevail and continue on. There have been many agnostic and, and atheists down through the centuries that have said Christianity will not prevail. The Bible will not prevail. There's one man that, that famously boasted that 20, 30 years after his death, there would not be a Bible found anywhere on the face of the earth except in a dusty museum somewhere. And true story, years after he passed away, somebody bought his house and they turned it into a printing press for Bibles. All right. So, so all the, and this is real. That's not just a made up thing. That, that's real. So God has, has done everything that he can do and he has committed his truth to writing so that all of us can actually see it and know it. And this, of course, then makes the scriptures absolutely essential. And that's kind of the long way of getting around to the point this evening is knowing that the only way we're going to know about Jesus and really know about God in his fullness is through the Bibles. That makes this absolutely essential. This is cannot be optional. It must be essential. And we'll know that again in a greater way as we go to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And we'll look at this scripture and then we'll pray. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, just as a, a follow-up to what we just read, to remind us uh, why we need the word of God, why we need the scriptures. 1 Corinthians 1, the Apostle Paul is revisiting in his mind as he's writing this letter to the Corinthians, his first time among them before they knew Jesus. And he's kind of reminding them of his first trip to Corinth and what he did when he was there. And so we begin in verse 18. And he says this, the word of the cross is to those who are perishing foolishness. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the cleverness of the clever I will set aside. Where is the wise man? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not come to know God, God was well pleased through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. Do you get that? So he can't come to salvation through the, ris the wisdom of the world. God was pleased to offer this through the preaching of the word of God. That's how salvation comes. And then again, we read it. For indeed, Jews ask for signs and Greeks search for wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified to Jews a stumbling block and to Gentiles foolishness. But to those who are the called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For consider your calling, brethren, that there were not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things which are strong. He's, he's, he's chosen the base things of the world, the despised things God has chosen, the things that are not, that he might nullify the things that are. Why? So that no man should boast before God. But by his doing, you are, but by his doing, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that just as it is written, let him who boasts... Boast in the Lord. Amen? So the word of the cross is salvation for us. The importance of the scriptures, they're essential. They're not just optional for a Christian. And that'll be our topic tonight. And let's just go ahead and bow and pray. Heavenly Father, 
Lord, even us studying your word tonight without the quickening and the working of your spirit, it can be just a mental exercise and we don't want that. We don't want just information, but we want transformation in our hearts and in our lives. And so I pray that as we study your word tonight, that you would grant that trans transformation to us by your spirit. Open up our eyes to see and open up our ears to hear what you would say to us tonight. We are all here by divine appointment. You love us. You want us here to listen to and to consider your word, Lord, and to put it into action in our lives. And to ask ourselves these all important questions. Do we really, really believe what we say we believe? Help us as we answer that question tonight as it concerns the Bible, your word. And we'll give you the honor and the glory for we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. amen. And amen. So tonight what I want to do is just ask us maybe some soul searching questions. But I think that they're questions that are well served for us as believers. And so um, just grant me some time here. I've written a lot of these down and just want to uh, ask you to bear with me as we ask these questions, hopefully of ourselves. Not This is not for somebody else besides you. This is for you as it concerns the scriptures. And do we really believe the scriptures are necessary and essential? Do we really believe that? So here are some of the questions. What would it look like for us to live in light, I mean, to truly live in the light of the inspiration, the authority, the sufficiency of the word of God. What would that look like in our lives? Um, I heard, uh, um, and, and his name escapes me now, it's, it's, it's not uh, Tozer, it may have been Raven Hill, um, I can't remember. But, but one brother said, uh, one day some simple Christian is going to pick up the word of God, read it, and then live it out. And the rest of us are going to be embarrassed <laughs> because he's, just, he's actually going to do what the Bible says to do. And, and I think there's a lot of truth in that. And I think we have to start by asking ourselves the question, what would our lives really look like? Are, are, do you believe that your life right now is looking exactly like it would if you fully, completely believed in the inspiration, authority, and sufficiency of Scripture? And this is the question we have to ask ourselves. It was a book that was written long ago uh, along this premise. And we now uh, have shortened it down and we, we use the, um, you know, what would Jesus do as, as the statement that we make. Um, it was called In His Steps. And the book was basically a challenge from a minister to his congregation to say, let's live out the next year. Everything that we do, everything that we say to the best of our ability with the work of obviously with the help of the Holy Spirit to actually consider, OK, what would just Jesus do in this situation? How would Jesus respond in this situation? What would he do with my time that I have here or my money that I or whatever it might be? And so it was called in his steps. And from that, we gathered this question. What would Jesus do? And, and I think that's really the point is if we really believe in the Bible and we believe in its inspiration, it's come from God, it's given to us, it is sufficient for all that we have need of, what would our lives really look like? Would they be any different than how we're living right now? And you can only answer that for yourself. I'm not here to try and answer for you or for you to answer to me, but to just ask the Lord, help me in answering that question. Here's another one on top of that. If you really believe that the Bible is the word of God, preserved by God, for you individually, for all of us, but for you, let's make it personal. Wouldn't it be the most valuable, esteemed, treasured, and well-used possession in your life? Wouldn't it be? If you really believe it, if you really believe it, this is the word of God. This is God speaking to me. Would it not be the most important, treasured, esteemed, loved, well-used item in your life? I think we have to ask ourselves that. But for many, the Bible is just a dusty book that's opened up once in a while. There are a lot of other things that gain a lot more attention. Maybe today in 2022, many people would say that their phones are used a lot more than their Bible. Their computers are used a lot more than their Bible. There are you know, many, many things. But if we really, I mean, if we really believed this is God speaking to us. How much more would we use the word of God? How much more would we treasure it? How much more would we value it above everything else? 
that if, if, the, if the question was asked, okay, you can either only have your Bible or have this other thing, how many times would we choose the other thing, whatever it might be? I hope not, but it's a question we need to ask ourselves. How about this one? Would you not love the moments when you could sit with it, read it carefully, study its content, and meditate on its implications? If you really believed that it's God's word, would we not cherish that time? Would we not love it with all of our heart? There's so many things that we love, so many things that we enjoy and that we treasure those times that we have. Oh, I can't wait to get out of work to get to this, or I can't wait till I can get to that or speak to that person. Or do, and we cherish all of that. How about the word of God? Are we in that place where we would just, oh, every day I want to carve out time to be with the Lord and let him speak to me through his word. That's the question that we ask ourselves. Wouldn't you commit yourself to be an avid reader and a lifelong student of the word of God if you believed it was really God's word? Would we not? How foolish would we be not to if we really believed it was just that? There are a lot of people that have never read through the word of God once. They've never read through the 66 books of the Bible even one time, even if they've known the Lord for 10, 20, 30, 40 years. If it's really the living, active sword, the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God, if it's that, would we not say, yeah, i got to read it regularly. In fact, I want to know it better than I would know any other book or anything else. I want to know that book. Can I get any amens on this? I know this is, but this is important because we're asking the question, do we really believe? So I think these are soul-searching questions for us. All right, how about this? Wouldn't you work to make sure that you've understood and interpreted it correctly? Wouldn't you work on that? I would think we would. And wouldn't you treasure the teachers and the preachers whom God has raised up to help you walk through and understand the word of God? I certainly do. The people in my life, I, I treasure these men and women of God that have helped me to understand and grow in the word of God because it's that important to me. And so, again, these are questions we would. Wouldn't you want to make sure that everything that you desire, think, say and do was done in joyful submission and careful obedience to the word of God? If you really believed that the scriptures were absolutely essential to your lives, would you not ask these questions of yourself? Wouldn't you want to apply the Bible into every area in your life? How many people, they, they section off their lives? Well, I have my spiritual life that I observe when I come to church. Maybe once in a while, if I'm thinking about it at home, I might you know, take a, a couple of minutes here or there, and that's my spiritual life. But then here's the rest of my life. And I do what I want to do with the rest of my life. If we really believed that the Bible was all sufficient for us, and it is, would we not want to uh, do all that we could to apply to every area of our life? Wouldn't you run to its comfort and heed its call? Wouldn't, wouldn't it have more influence over your decisions than your friends, than Google or Twitter or anything else? I mean, the news, whatever. Wouldn't the Bible have more influence over you than all of those things? If you really believe this is God, my creator, who loves me more than anyone else speaking to me? <laughs> Wouldn't biblical literacy and theological knowledge be a lifelong quest that you, yeah, I want to know. I want to know this book. I want to be able to, to, to read it properly and understand it properly. It would be a lifelong quest if we really believed this book is what God says it is. Wouldn't you be looking for every opportunity to share the message with others? That's a big one. If we really believe the Bible and if we really believe that it says what it says about people and that if you believe in Jesus, you're going to heaven. But if you do not believe, if you have not turned to him and submitted your life to him, then you're going to hell. If we really, really, and we'll cover that later, but that's just a question right now. It should be a lifelong ambition for all of us to share this good news with everyone else. How much do you have to hate someone to not share the word of God with them? To not share the good news? You got to hate somebody an awful lot to really, I don't want them to know because I'd rather they go to hell. Oh, come on. None of us would say that. But when we fail to share the scriptures with people, are we not just kind of 
not explicitly, but you know, we're kind of in a backwards way saying, okay, yeah, it's not that important. It's got to be that important, or it should be, if we really believe. Amen? Wouldn't you grieve those moments when you have to confess that you ignored or resisted its message to you? Wouldn't there be times of, of grieving in your heart because you knew you ignored what the Word said? We couldn't just pass over that and just, ah, oh, that's not a big deal. It would have to be a big deal for us. Wouldn't it be the things that shape the way that you approach every area of your life? Wouldn't the Word of God be that thing above all else? It would shape every area of your life. Just a couple more if you're squirming. Just a couple more here. Wouldn't that quiet time when you separate yourself, listen now, wouldn't that quiet time when you separate yourself from other people and other responsibilities and it's just you and the Lord and his word, wouldn't that be the favorite part of your day? Not least favorite, not, oh, I guess I need to do this. That would be my favorite part, right, of the day, if I really believe. Another one, just, just bear with me here. Wouldn't you give God heartfelt praise for the amazing gift of his word every single day? Because you're opening it up and he's speaking to you. And every day your heart just bursts forth with praise and thanks and joy. Thank you, Lord, for giving me your word. Thank you for loving me enough to speak to me, Amen. to give it to me in written form so that I can't forget it and I can read it again and again and it can really get into my heart. We should do that with joy. And if the Bible that we have in our homes and can hold in our hands is the word of God, shouldn't what I've just described be true of every single one of us? Call ourselves Christians. That can't just be, well, it's just for you, Pastor. You're, just, you're describing just the really, the elite. There is no elite Christian and regular Christian. There is no such thing. We're all followers of Jesus. Amen. We're either in love with him or we're not. We either are thankful for his word or we're not. Amen? But again, do we really, really believe? And, and I, I think the reality is, is that sadly, many Christians don't. They don't spend time in their Bibles like they should. Uh, and, and many people have a very low, we, every time I see these studies from Barna or one of these others and they ask and they do a survey and they're asking people that claim to be Christians and they ask them basic Bible stuff and they're all over the map. I mean, they're all over the map on what they really believe. So yeah, I'm a Christian. What, so do you really believe in, in just a heaven or a hell? You know, in a huge swath. Well, I, I don't know about that. But you say you're a Christian. Is Jesus the only way to heaven? Well, I, yeah. <laughs> Wait a minute, you said you're a Christian. You said you've read the Bible. How can you, you know, how can you possibly be backing away from those type of statements? So again, do we really, really believe? And, and, and the truth is, folks, is that, that many Christians have voices of influence in their lives that you know, functionally are more authoritative than scripture. They listen to those other voices and those voices have more authority in their lives than the scriptures do. And that's why we're in the sad place that we're at. That, that, that's why the church in America is not what it needs to be. And that's why many, many people are leaving organized. I understand we call it organized Christianity. It's not really that, but I understand their thought. Many people are saying, I don't want any of this. I don't want any part of this. It's, it's just, it's fake. Folks, it starts with us. We are, it, it, people are reading us. The apostle Paul said, we're the letters of God that are openly submitted to everyone to read. So that, so we are the ones that unbelievers, before they get into the Bible, they're going to read our lives and that's going to tell them, well, does this, is this God that you're talking about? Is he real in your life? Is he changing your life or not? And, and unfortunately for many, they have other voices of authority that they listen to more than they do the scriptures. Many are, you know, many people, they hear the word of God and they're fed from it one hour, maybe two hours a week in church, maybe a little bit on the side for themselves, but then they're, they're consuming hours and hours every day of whether it's social media or news media or something else. There are a lot of people that are, are much more apt to be able to tell you what um, either the, the president said or what 
um, uh, Tucker Carlson said or whatever. You know, I'm just throwing out names. Whoever the, the person. Of, oh, I, yeah. Did you hear them? Did you hear them? How about did we hear God's word? Did we hear, were we excited about God's word? Is that not a little bit more important and a little more authoritative than what anyone else says? Amen. Yes, it is. Amen. Lord, help us in these things. And so now, if we're not reading the word of God, if we're, if we're not allowing God to speak to us, then is it no wonder that, the, that we don't have influence in these areas of our life that we need desperately from the word of God? Our sense of identity. See, our sense of identity is all over the map, and it should come straight from the word of God. The way we make decisions should come straight from the scriptures. Amen? How about the, the shape of our friendships? What kind of friendships do we have? Who are we hanging out with? Who do we value? Who do we want to be around? These things should be shaped by the word of God. How about the way we approach our education? Even that should, be, should, should actually be shaped by the word of God. How about the way we pursue our jobs and the way we pursue our careers? Should be, that should be Jesus. What do you want? What do you have for me? Amen? Amen. How about this? The way that we approach Romance and marriage. Oh, what? No, no, that's, that's not God's domain. It's not? Of course it is. Of course it is. God instituted marriage. He thought it up. God instituted romance. Come on. All these things, but yet we, we don't approach these things with God's word at the forefront. How about the way we parent our children? How about how we deal with conflict? The word of God has answers for all of these things. But if we're influenced by others, and the conflict thing is very big, as you've heard me say, because we're a, we're a nation of outrage. Everyone is outraged, because outrage is one of those emotions that, that can pump people up and would get just, you know, more than anything else. And so everything is outraged. Well, when conflict comes, how about let's see what the Word of God says? Not what worldly people are telling us, not what worldly people are telling us to do. That, that can't be the answer. How about how we handle success or failure, either one? The Word of God would speak to us in these areas. How about, okay, now get ready. Cover up your feet, all right, because you're going to get your feet stepped on, possibly. The things that we do with our money. I heard a pen drop. The word of God would, would tell us some things about that. It really would. How about this? Where we look for our fulfillment. We all have that. Folks, there's none of us here. It's, it's innate within us. We want to, to have that sense of fulfillment. That's not a bad thing. That's, that's normal. But, but the sense and the longing of fulfillment can only truly be found in Jesus and through the word of God. But we seek that fulfillment in so many other ways. And so many, oh, I'm bored or, I'm, or there's something missing in my life. There's something lacking in my life. And we run to all the other sources instead of the word of God. What about this? How, how we deal with difficulty. How we deal with difficulty. If we're not listening to the word of God and other sources and other voices are coming in, we're going to deal with difficulty in ways that are not going to be God honoring. How about also this? The way we deal with media and entertainment. How about that? We have to ask ourselves these questions on a regular basis. I mean, I, we, we just have to. And then finally, I'll just throw one more in. How about how we deal with our relationship within the body of Christ and with relationships with the body of Christ. How many people now are out there, I'm not going to any church. They've all burned me. I'm tired of it. I'm not just going anywhere. Well, you're outside the will of God. If there is a place that you can come and that you can worship, you may not agree on everything, but if you're just going to be the Lone Ranger Christian, I'm telling you, you're out of the will of God. It cannot be. Can I get a couple of amens? Amen. <laughs> this is the way it is. Oh, no, they hurt me. They upset me. And some people just place to place to place, and everywhere they go in, within a few months or whatever, oh, no, that person upset me. I'm out of there. I mean, it's just, it's, it's no good, folks. We can't grow that way. The Word of God informs us in all of these areas, 
And so it's no, it's no wonder that the church of the Lord is dysfunctional in many ways um, and that we're not, we're not getting done what we need to do. We're spending too much time constantly with those that are sick and weak and, 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 and we're not getting the gospel message out because all of us are so messed up. We're just constantly putting band-aids on one another, one on top of another, on top of another. And, and here are people lost outside that our energies are not even devoted to. Because again, why? Because we're not living in accordance with the Bible. Because we're wanting to do it our way and we keep messing up. We keep falling off the bike. After a while, you know, I know some people are more coordinated than others. And I, I get it. I remember, I, hey, one of my childhood memories is riding the bike up the tree in my front yard. I mean, just a couple of, you know, and I went up the tree. But guess what? I'm not still going up the tree on the bike. I mean, you've got to progress. You've got to move forward. If you, you see what I'm saying? And so as believers, if we're constantly riding up the, the tree or falling off constantly and having the boo-boos and we got to, you know, for one another, is it no wonder then that we're not getting out? And maybe we're supposed to be using the bike and delivering the papers. But no, we can't do that because we've fallen off. We're not learning how to ride the bike. And so nobody's getting the good news. Nobody's hearing because we just, you know, right here happen to put band-aids on one another spiritually. You see what I'm saying? It's no good. I guess the final thing I'd say to you, if someone could come in and have access 24-7 in your life and just one month of your life, look in, watch, see how you're living your life, what you're giving time to, what you're, and, and they have that, that type of access in your life. If they could do that, what would they conclude about the place that God's word has in your life? What would they conclude if we're being really honest? For many, we would have to hang our heads, right? And say, it probably wouldn't be what it should be. And other than our salvation and his presence by his spirit living inside of us right now as his children, other than that, I believe that our Bible is God's most precious gift given to us. Amen. And we should love it. Amen. And we should cherish it. And as we move forward next week on Wednesday night, if we're, if we're still here, I want us to, to consider the, the, the question that I want us to look at or the things I want us to look at uh, and to consider is, is what God provides for us in and through his word so that we can live the way that God has designed us to live through his word. And, and, and we're going to see, you're going to see the word of God, how much it does for us. What God's word has, has given to us if we will just simply believe it like we say we believe it. This, isn't, this, this can't just be a decoration. This can't just be walking around and look at my big Bible here I've got and I'll pop you with it. Oh, I'm a Bible believer. I'm telling you I'm a Bible believer. That, yeah, I believe in and that John 31, 26 yeah, I believe in that, you know, and I, if that's, if that's the way that, you know, if that's where we're at, then, then, you know, we're in trouble. So I, yeah, we want to, we want to, to consider what God's word provides in and through his, it, it, the scriptures so that we can live as he has designed us to live in the place where he's put us. And, and God wants to do that. Do we really believe? Do you really believe that this is essential? That this is God's word given to us? If we do, then starting tonight, starting tomorrow, if you've not been in the habit, let's pick it up. I don't care where you start. You want to start in the Gospel of John, that's fine. You want to start if you want to pick up we, in, in the readings that usually most Bibles, and we have readings that we give out where you can read through the Bible in a year and actually a little bit more, that's fine. Wherever, but just start somewhere and let's just start reading. Let's spend time. And see, as you do this, you say, I have to, it, 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 and maybe this is you, I don't know, but if it is and you're just being really honest between yourself and the Lord, you might say, I, I'm really struggling because I don't have the desire. I know I should up here have this great desire, but I, I, I'm just not desiring it like I should. That's just between you and the Lord. But if you're admitting that to yourself, can I just tell you something that's really awesome about how God works his spirit and his word together? 
the more that you will get into it, the more you will grow to love it. It's not something that you're going to have to push yourself and say, oh, it's going to be, man, it's like pulling teeth every day. I promise you, if you will, by his spirit, make that effort to begin to read it, you will see how it, you will come to love it more and more. That's the thing about being in God's word. You will love it the more that you're in it. The less you're in it, the less you're going to love it. But the more you're in it, the more you're going to love it. That's the dynamic. That's the way it works. I see a few of you shaking your head yes. Is that, is that not true? I think it's absolutely true. And so this is what we want to do. Brother Ivor, would you come? And, and so we've just kind of asked some questions, but we've seen from the book of Romans and from 1 Corinthians, we've seen the importance of the word of God. We have to have his word to lead us and to guide us. We can't do it on our own. The world's not going to give us the right message. It has its own wisdom. It's not God's wisdom. God has given us his wisdom through his word. Do we really believe it's essential? I hope we do. Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much. Forgive us if we have neglected your word. Forgive us, Lord, if we've just allowed the, the world and the things of the world to really just push out time that we would spend with you. Forgive us. Help us, Lord. We want to grow in you. Lord, if there's some here that, that the thought of getting into your word is not as maybe exciting as it should be, I pray tonight you would light a fire inside of each and every one of us by your spirit and that we would persevere through, knowing, Lord, that the more we read, the more we're going to want to read, that that's just how your, that's how your scriptures work in our lives. And so I pray that every person here, that what we say we believe is what we really believe and it will be proven out by the, the time and the place that we give your word in our lives. And we'll thank you for these things. I'm believing you for good things as we move forward. In Jesus' name, amen and amen.